Good afternoon, everyone. This is not a square teddy bear, but it's a microphone that at the end you can use to ask questions. My name is Melissa Melpignano. I'm one of the conference organizers, and it's a huge pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Alex Mayer. Dr. Alex Mayer is a professor of civil engineering here at QTEP. Um, Dr. Mayer's teaching and research focuses on finding collaborative solutions to water resources problems through modeling of watersheds and groundwater aquifers and interactions with stakeholders. His current research topics include water resources, uh, water resource systems modeling, transboundary aquifer governance, impact of sea level rise on coastal groundwater aquifers, water access in underserved populations, climate change impact on urban water availability, and tree benefit and water use in desert cities. His research has taken place in the Rio Grande Basin, the Caribbean, uh, the Laurentian Great Lakes and Sonora and Veracruz in Mexico, and I'm sure uh, way beyond. <laughs> Dr. Alex Mayer is also one of the founders of World Water Week and uh, the co-director of the One Water Cluster that organizes the conference and sponsors the conference. Um, before I share the title of Dr. Mayer's uh, speech, uh, I want to invite all the students uh, present here to make sure that you sign up. Outside there's a table. If you haven't signed up coming in, you can uh, do it on the way out. So you, you make sure that your attendance is marked. Uh, the title of the talk is What do climate change and binational water sharing mean for water availability in the Rio Grande Basin? And this talk directly tackle our conference team for this year, Bridging Borders, Leveraging Water for Peace. Please, let's welcome Dr. Alex Mayer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Really nice to be introduced this quickly to uh, by such a big crowd of folks. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to, to give this talk. So, so how many of you know what this scene is about here? Have you, first of all, do you know the state of water in the Earth in the last, uh, about the last year or so? Do you all know the river Arguin that runs from Bolivia to Colombia? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, it's been uh, so what is happening here? Anybody care to tell us? <coughs> Go ahead. You see the trees, you see the reservoir. Can you make it stand on the river? Okay, so that'll be good. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so we live in kind of an unusual place, right? And our, our relationship to water is, I think, unusual because of that. Most of the year, the riverbed is dry. This year um, is a very good year in terms of water availability. So we're seeing water in the river in, in March, which hasn't happened for, for several, uh, several years. Um, and um, so as a, as a hydrologist, this stuff is just really exciting to me. I watch this on loop, you know, continuously. And you can give thanks for the high quality cinematography also to me. So, um, okay, good. Right, so th um, that uh, uh, to me, it's again, really interesting to see the, the, the river approaching uh, as, as it does every year. And um, some of the things I'm interested in then is, is uh, in, in my research and also in my educational outreach efforts is um, what, uh, what do we know about water availability in our region? And can we predict uh, the future um, of, that, of water availability? And so um, before I get started on, on that topic, I want to give some acknowledgments to the, the people that have contributed to this work, including graduate students and uh, academic um, collaborators and collaborators with various uh, institutions in, uh, along the border. And I want to especially acknowledge uh, my co close colleague, Josiah Hyman, who has contributed to some of the more interesting 
ideas in this. And this work has been funded uh, through a, a few different sources. And so what I want to do today is, is hopefully show you how we go about thinking about these the potential impacts of climate change, migration, and, and the presence of the border, uh, 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 and how they will impact our future water availability. So I want to show you how we study. We've studied that. Not always the, uh, the, the right, we don't always have the, the right answers necessarily, the answers that people are looking for. There's a lot of uncertainty. We don't really know what our water future looks like, but we think it's worthwhile to use some of the tools from hydrology and, and many other disciplines to try to, to make these predictions. So why do we, we do this? It's not just about El Paso and Juarez, although it's the focus of my talk, but more than one third of the world's largest cities are in dry lands. Uh, or dry lands are, are places where uh, uh, water scarcity is, um, is, is typical um, and that the uh, evaporation or losses of water are, are roughly equal to the amount of precipitation coming in. And these places are particularly vulnerable to climate change. And we expect that populations in the dry lands are going to grow substantially over the next at least half century, which will put further stress on water supplies that, that are already stretched. And um, part of our, my work is also oriented try, to try to understand how impacts of climate change and water scarcity will impact not just people on average, but about will impact people who are the most vulnerable. And we've seen with climate change already occurring that typically the impacts are felt most, mostly by the most, uh, the most vulnerable of our populations. So the regional context now to kind of uh, bore into the, the, the more local scene here is the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo Basin. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the geography, the river headwaters begin in, in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico in the form of snow melt. And then that water moves down through New Mexico uh, going from uh, north to south and eventually reaches us uh, here in uh, Ciudad Juarez in El Paso, where it becomes the border between the US and Mexico and eventually flows, uh, flows into the Gulf. So um, the vast majority of the water that we see here, including the water that you saw crep creeping along the riverbed there, originates as snow melt from quite far away, from hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And so, that's important for several reasons, including when we start talking about climate change, because it's these snowpack dominated basins, where uh, basins that depend on, on snow melt like we do, that are going to be the, that are already the most vulnerable to climate change and, and will be more so um, into the future. The other thing to notice about the geography is uh, we have two countries that uh, occupy the, the Rio Grande Basin, the US and Mexico. And in the US, we have uh, three states, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, and then also in, um, in Mexico, we have uh, four states too that are, that are um, in the basin. And uh, managing water across boundaries, whether it's country boundaries or state boundaries is not easy. It takes a lot of diplomacy to, to, to make that happen, which is the, the topic of, of this uh, year's World Water Week. So our focus is on the cities in that red square, including El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, and to some extent, the uh, uh, Las Cruces. Um, and again, as I already mentioned, uh, the uh, some years, the, uh, the, the vast majority of the water that we see coming down all the way to here comes from snow melt. And again, the, the river water is shared by two countries. We have a treaty that governs that, but also groundwater. And so there are a couple of, a few groundwater aquifers I'm gonna point out eventually in a map that, uh, that uh, cross the, between the US and Mexico. And um, so not only do hydrologists get excited by watching those movies on loop over and over again, but we get excited now because the Supreme Court of the United States is going to make a decision tomorrow, presumably, about a lawsuit between Texas, that Texas filed against uh, New Mexico and Colorado, uh, which has been uh, 
uh, tried in the Supreme Court now for I think more than more than ten years or so, and it originated from from before that. So that will, uh, it's very likely that decision will uh, cause some quite a bit of rearrangement of water availability in the in the basin, and I can get into those details in a bit here. So when we talk about water diplomacy, your first thought might go to say, well, the hardest part is um, is figuring out how to, to govern water between two countries. But when we have this going on, it's also hard to figure out how to govern water between multiple states. And just so you think that Texas is lawsuit happy, about uh, more than a couple of decades or so, New Mexico was suing Texas. So we, um, there, there are uh, lawyers to get wealthy on both sides, maybe. So anyway, yeah, pay, be glued to the TV tomorrow to see about the Supreme Court decision. Okay, so um, why look at El Paso and Ciudad Juarez besides they're, they're in our back, they're of course in our backyard and, and this is the place that we live. Um, but they're also emblematic of uh, cities that we see across the Southwest US and Northern Mexico where water uh, supplies are already scarce. Uh, most border cities are characterized by uh, having low income residents um, and other other factors that relate to vulnerability to climate change. And speaking of climate change, uh, average not only are average temperatures increasing in these cities, but also the very hot days, the days over 100 degrees, for example, are increasing. And also in these cities, uh, household cooling to be able to be resilient to those those hot days may not be sufficient. Uh, across the across the population, um, and so to reduce the risk of water scarcity and also heat, we need to have an, a clear understanding of the spatial patterns of where the bio, the occurrence of water scarcity uh, occurs and the uh, social vulnerability as defined by things like income, for example. Um, and then we need to understand what factors such as income uh, tend to amplify vulnerability to the shortages that might occur or increases in prices to, uh, of water that might occur are occurring now and also will intensify in the future. And then again, we have to deal with the fact that we're dealing with water resources that are shared across national and, and state boundary, which uh, 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 we don't always agree on how to, to manage our water much less uh, for the average person, much less we don't agree on how to manage the water to make sure the most vulnerable are not caught by climate change. So our overall questions here then were, how will climate change and changes in water demand that will be driven by migration primarily affect the availability of water? And we tend as hydrologists to divide up water in a few different ways, but one is between groundwater, which we find in aquifers and surface water, which basically means the river. So uh, the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo. And then uh, if we see that there are going to be increases in water scarcity, how will that affect the vulnerability of our, of our most vulnerable households? So to zero in a little bit on the region that we're talking about here, uh, to orient yourself in the map, you can see El Paso and Ciudad Juarez right on the border. And then if you go to the uh, the north a bit, if you were to drive up uh, Highway 20, Freeway 25, eventually you would get to Elephant Butte uh, Reservoir, which is about 100 miles, a bit more than 100 miles from here. And that's where the water that uh, um, water is stored during the time when the snow melt is coming down the river and then is released, as you saw in the video at the, at the very beginning. And the timing of that water release is not to, not, uh, to for our, uh, the advantage of the cities, it's really for irrigation, right? So they've, they release the water during the, the times of the year when we have the least rainfall here and when the crops need it the most. So our, our, our average precipitation sorry about the metric units, uh, is about 8.7 inches per year or about 22 centimeters per year. And then PET, that stands for uh, potential evapotranspiration. That's a really good word to use with your friends today. And what that means is if you look at the, uh, the, the that precipitation falls, you know, about nine inches per year, it hits the ground. 
the vast majority of that evaporates into the atmosphere, which is what it would do under natural circumstances, even if we weren't here. So sometimes, yes, you will see water running in the arroyos, um, uh, but usually that's very, very short-lived. The vast majority of the, of the water is evapotranspired. That's what happens in deserts, right, all around the, the world. So where, where, um, uh, where do we need water then? So we have in the region um, uh, almost 90,000 hectares of irrigated agriculture. And the irrigation rates can be up to 130 centimeters per year, um, which is about four feet per year. So if, if, if the irrigated agriculture needs up to four feet per year and it rains nine inches per year, how does that work? The plants, the plants in this case, the pecan trees need four feet of water. Imagine four feet of water, applying four feet of water over a year. Uh, over all of, all of your acres in your pecan orchard, but it's only raining nine inches a year. So where does that difference come from? From the river, right? So the river is renewable, right? The river flows every year, sometimes less than others, but um, that snow melt, the snowpack is renewed every year. Again, less and less in recent years. Uh, so we can take water out of the river, and then we can also take water out of groundwater. And we'll get back to groundwater in, in a bit here. And then urban areas, so the population of Ciudad Juarez is, is getting closer and closer to 2 million. Uh, the population of El Paso County is about 800,000. And so now uh, that means we need uh, 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 water to, uh, for our households and for the, the bit of industry that we have here. And then if we look at water use for drinking water, it's really tiny, right, compared to the overall use in a household. About 50% of the water used in households in, in El Paso is used for outdoor irrigation. And those outdoor irrigation rates could be as high as 100 centimeters per year. Uh, Luis, can you do the conversion for me real quick? I'm, I'm, uh, how much? Which one? Uh, 100 centimeters per year. Three feet? Yeah, about three feet. Okay. Uh, so it rains nine inches a year, but the to grow grass, for example, it can take three feet of water per year. So where does that difference come from? We had our hydrology lesson already, right? Mm -hmm. Groundwater and, and the river, right? The river, again, is renewable. The groundwater, maybe not so much. Um, but the volume of groundwater available at least in the beginning, was staggering. It's a huge amount of, of groundwater uh, compared to uh, the amount of water, for example, stored in Elephant View. So the, yeah, please, yeah. Yes, yeah, so if you took, uh, yes, yeah. Does everybody understand that? Like, how can you talk about you know, irrigating things in terms of centimeters and inches, kind of, sort of. So if you had a farm that was 100 acres and you knew you had to apply four feet of water to grow your pecans, you multiply four feet times 100 acres, do the unit conversion in your head, right? You know how many. Uh, and, and what comes out is the volume of water you would need for your particular orchard that's 100 acres. So it's, you know, it's, it's a nice way to describe it, I think, because it doesn't matter how big the farm is. It's just if you know how many acres of pecans you have, you just multiply it by that. Have I convinced you? OK. And then the same with like the turf grass again, right? So you have so many acres of grass at your household, multiply that by, uh, again, about three feet per year. And that's how much water you're going to have to buy your house to, to, sustain, uh, to sustain the grass. OK, so what are the things um, we need to, to, to understand uh, uh, the demand for water in the region? We, could look at a little bit of, of history. And so here I'm plotting the population of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. 
And you can see, at least starting in the 50s, you can see that early on the, the, the populations of the two cities were roughly equal. Before 1950, El Paso was much, much bigger than Juarez typically. But there were several um, uh, economic developments that occurred to drive up the populations on both sides of the border, and especially in Ciudad Juarez. So before 1950, what brought people to the region uh, were the, the, at least the Europeans were either cattle, cotton, railroads, or forts, or military. Um, and then uh, as, the, uh, as more and more people came, the commercial growth started to grow, and uh, started to commercial establishments started to grow in El Paso. And then in, uh, in Mexico, the, the border industrialization program, which was meant to increase developments along the border, uh, started in the 1970s, and that was really the launch of the industrialization of the border that then NAFTA uh, in, the, in the 1990s uh, really fueled it, fueled it even further. Um, in El Paso, El Paso used to have a pretty substantial manufacturing core to it, but that declined as, as, uh, as businesses left to go to cheaper places. Um, so that Juarez's population uh, was way on the way up, slowed down a bit in terms of increase during the violent spikes in the, in the 2000, 2010. El Paso continued to grow because of the growth of the port, growth of trade uh, between, uh, between US and Mexico, and also because of the uh, 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 military too. And then agriculturally, uh, before the 1950s, again, it was cattle or cotton were the main crops with cotton being the, the big water demander back then agriculturally. Um, and then uh, also uh, uh, what um, alfalfa for growing uh, not just uh, beef cattle, but the primarily for, for dairy cows was, was the big thing. But then starting in the early, in the mid 2000s, uh, pecans began to supplant the cotton and, and also the alfalfa. And uh, uh, with that, uh, the uh, increase of use of water of uh, pecans versus cotton, a difference in increased use of water for pecans versus cotton and alfalfa drove up the agricultural demand um, further. And agricultural demand both for river water and also for groundwater. So any, any questions, comments so far? Okay, um, so now getting into a little bit of climate change or climate variability, the plot on this page is the amount of water stored in Elephant Butte Reservoir, which I mentioned is the main water supply storage uh, reservoir for river water um, in our region. And so the, the, the numbers there are, are not terribly important. What's important is to look at the ups and downs the red dash line is the maximum storage capacity where uh, if the water increases any further, they have to spill it over the spillway. And it's only gotten that high just a few times in the, in the last uh, um, about 100 years or so. And you can see some uh, cyclical sorts of things there. Uh, you can see like uh, the, 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 the reservoir is filled in the early 20s. Uh, some ups and downs, ups and down, and then in the 1950s, you've probably heard of the Dust Bowl. So that's the, uh, um, that's the effects of the drought that was felt across the entire southern United States. And then some very wet years where we said, yeah, we're going to get that much water every year. Um, and that much water going up to the red dotted line means that everybody gets what their share is uh, for the irrigators, right? So they have water rights typically on the order of about three feet a year, spread again over all of those irrigated uh, uh, acres. But then starting in the early 2000s, um, the reservoir storage uh, decreased substantially. And that all of these ups and downs are related to, to what? Where, here? Okay, but where specifically would it affect this the most? Where is where does most of our water come from? Does it come from rainfall here? Yeah, 
Yeah, so the snowpack. So this is, these ups and downs are controlled by the amount of snowpack and also the timing of the snow melt. So if it melts very early, um, less runoff is, is generated. And if it was a dry year before, uh, the soil has to take up the water before it can start flowing into rivers. And so there's sort of a attenuation, there's a, there's a feedback effect where you get dry, 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 it gets harder and harder and harder to generate real, real runoff because the soil is going to take up so much of uh, so, so much of the water. So you see about more than a 20 year uh, uh, cycle there of dry. And this is also not just here, that's across the Southwest of the United States. And now we're, we're proud as hydrologists to say that the mega drought that we experienced over, over those 20, more than 20 years was the biggest, the biggest me mega drought since the 700s. So, uh, sorry, I don't mean to chuckle over that. It's a terrible thing, but uh, that's what hydrologists get excited about. So this is what not just experienced here, but also in the Colorado River and elsewhere through the, the Southwest. So we'll see what happens now that we had a relatively good year. Uh, actually, a lot of the water that we're seeing flowing in the river is not the result of snow melt directly. It's water that was stored from previous years that was banked. So that's not new water. That's water that was stored because it wasn't uh, needed for whatever reason or the other. So we're having a good year because of uh, some people decided to store their water, not necessarily because they thought they were they were, uh, thought they that would be used later or, or thought it would be a, a dry year the next year. Okay, so um, now to get into to how we, we can go about answering these research questions. So first again, uh, how will climate change and changes in water demand affect water availability for both river water and groundwater? So first to start with river water or surface water, uh, we need to make projections of how much water will be coming into Elephant Butte, uh, all the way from the headwaters down to the down to Elephant Butte, and we do that with with models. And you should never believe models, right? All models are wrong. Just some are useful. We hope ours are useful. Um, and the way the models work is they take in data, precipitation, and temperature, climate data, pre uh, precipitation, and temperature. And then what comes out of the model is the snow that's generated, the snow melt that's generated, runoff from rainfall, and then that evaporation. Um, and that tell, gives us then projections into the future of flows in rivers and, uh, and, and then how much water will come into and be stored in the reservoir. And so um, to get to that point of doing that modeling, we have to start with using uh, data uh, or inputs from global at atmospheric circulation models. So these are models that are run to uh, predict the, temp the uh, temperature, precipitation, and so forth across the entire uh, across the entire globe. And so our interest might be our area is going to be far less than one of those squares there. So we take the data at the scale of maybe a hundredth of that square. And it's going to not be exactly right. And so we do some statistical, whoops, some statistical magic called downscaling. And so what that does is it corrects for the fact that the global model is really coarse, right? The weather happens at a very fine scale. But these global models are modeling hundreds of miles by hundreds or thousands, hundreds of miles by hundreds of miles in some cases, and so they need to be uh, conditioned sort of to the, to the real thing. So then, uh, so there, uh, we, we, we trust the models, but there are lots of different models, and that's because the atmospheric physicists, bless their hearts, can't exactly agree on how to do this modeling. It's still a really hard thing to do. And so there are multiple models that are used to make these projections. And then in addition, uh, we don't know what the future holds, right? So um, if it wasn't uh, clear, what I'm talking about here is projecting climate out into the future. And uh, we don't know what the future holds, not only because we don't quite understand all the physics of the atmosphere yet, or at least how to model them, all those physical processes, but we don't know socially what's gonna happen, right? We don't know 
if we're going all the way to 2100, how do we know what the population increase is going to be? And then how do we know how the population will react to the climate crisis? So you can have your optimistic, the green line here, this is the uh, global mean temperature change over, over a 100 year period. So barely any increase, we've already overshot this, sorry. Um, and then sort of a middle range and then a very pessimistic range. Uh, not because we like to be pessimistic, but we have to anticipate some of the worst cases uh, when we um, are trying to make uh, projections. So um, what this means then is there's a lot of uncertainty in the models. We don't know which model is best. And then we also don't soci know socially ex what's, going to be, what, what's going to happen. And uh, what that means is that we have to do uh, uh, what's called multiple scenario modeling. So the model, this is a model of the reservoir. So the box is the reservoir. And we solve what is really turns out to be a pretty simple equation to determine how the storage in the reservoir changes as a result of water coming in. So this is where the snow melt comes in. And then local precipitation, that's not really that important. This is important. Local evaporation, which is can be quite important. Local runoff, not that important. And then this is the water that's released downstream and eventually makes its way down to, um, to El Paso. And so this is really just like a bathtub, right? If you had to predict how the water level in, a, in the bathtub is changing as you either change the amount of water coming out of the faucet or the amount of going out the drain, you could figure that out, right? Okay, or this is like a bank account, right? This is the money in the bank. These are the different ways that the money comes in and the money leaves. It's, it's no more complicated than that. Thank you. Okay, and so what we do is we, uh, we take in then uh, we use historical data because we, believe it or not, we don't know everything. There's some parameters that need to be tuned here. So we use historical data to, uh, get, to get those last few uh, uh, parameters by comparing our, our model to what's happened in the past. Once we believe in that, then we start doing our projections and our projections go from about 2020 to 2070. Because there's so much uncertainty we run 100 different climate inputs or almost 100 different climate inputs to that model. And then we get 100 different projections for the future. So um, what comes out is basically spaghetti, right? Because we, uh, we have so much uncertainty in uh, what's going to be happening uh, climatically in the future. So we tend to use statistics then to sort of boil everything down, <clears throat> excuse me, or aggregate the data. So for example, this is showing us how temperature, local temperature is going to change from the last 50 years to the future 50 years. And so this is called a box and whisker plot. You may have seen these in some of your classes perhaps. The middle line is the median. So um, you can compare those two middle lines to look at sort of the overall, sort of the average. And then these whisker things here tell you the spread across the, the uncertainty that we have. So um, if we just look at this plot, though, we can see there's not going to be that much of a difference in, in uh, temperature, at least locally, between, uh, for, between these 50 years and, whoops, sorry, and the, uh, and the next 50 years. However, the variability is going to increase substantially, right? So we may have some very cool years, but we could also have some much, much hotter. And so when we're making decisions about how to face the future, do we go with the middle? Do we go with the average? Do we get really optimistic? Or do we go up at the top? So that's what decision makers have to wrestle with is, uh, is, is how to, uh, is where to be on these charts. Um, sorry, that was precipitation. Okay, so precipitation will not change much. It'll decrease a bit. However, temperature, that was a bad mistake. Uh, we expect the median, on the median, that, that uh, temperatures will increase by 
uh, by three degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Again, um, there's uh, um, maybe that doesn't seem so bad, not that I'm trying to scare you, but the variability is also substantial too. So again, we don't know what the future is. This is our best bet. Well, I don't know about best bet, but this is the best we can do. This is like the middle. But do you plan for the middle or do you plan for the, uh, for the tails? And then lastly, these are predictions of water coming into Elephant Butte. So this is where the climate change impacts on snowmelt is going to take place. And uh, so this is what we had for the last 50 years, and this is what we expect for the next 50 years. So there's a substantial decrease in the middle, but also you can see that we could have some, about 12% decrease on the median. Uh, we could have some very wet years into the future, but we could also have some extremely uh, dry years. So again, where do you plan? Okay, and what do you think is the expense of the planning or the projects we would need to plan for down here versus up there, right? Whatever we have to do to adapt to climate change um, is, is, going to, uh, is going to cost money. Okay, I think I'll just skip this, but basically, uh, sorry about the news here. We're saying that the droughts will get longer and more severe. Uh, and in other words, what we saw for the last 20 years or so could start to become the norm of the future uh, sometime in the, in the next couple of, of decades. Okay, um, so that was the story for surface water. And with groundwater, what's important to realize is that uh, the river water is relatively inexpensive for irrigators and for the city, but the, um, the river water isn't always there. And so when it's not there, or there's too little of it, or too little of it, then there's going to be more groundwater pump to to meet that uh, that demand. And so the both the city uh, the urban users and the uh, irrigators will tend to use the river water first, and then when there's not enough groundwater, or sorry, not, not enough river water, they'll tend to use more more groundwater. So for example, if you look back in history. If it's a bad river water, water year, the city of El Paso will make up almost all that loss in river water by pumping rather than cu cutting back. Irrigators, not always the case, they'll make up about 80% of it because water does have an expense for them, even, uh, no matter what you, you might hear. Uh, and so if a farmer is growing an annual crop like cotton, they can decide, they can say, this is a bad river water year, I can't afford to pump. And so I'm going to forego planting my cotton this my, my my cotton this year. If you're growing pecans, can you afford to forego pumping? Okay, that's a that's a uh, that's a perennial crop, right? It has to be kept alive every year. So we call that a hardening of agricultural demand, right? If we have annual crops, if we have to deal with the drought, the loss is not. So great, but if you have perennial crops that have to be kept alive year after year, you have to keep those, uh, you don't have to, but you wanna keep your, your, your trees alive so they can continue to, uh, to produce. Okay, um, now what we, the next thing we did is some groundwater modeling. And uh, groundwater modeling is something I've been doing all my career, and I like to use fancy models with equations that nobody else can understand uh, and wave my hands, but the groundwater models are a piece of junk if they don't have the data for them. And so I tended to use models that are just about as simple as modeling a bathtub. And that bathtub model just says that the change in storage in the bathtub or the aquifer is equal to what's recharged coming out of the faucet into the bathtub minus the pumping, which in the bathtub would be the water going down the, the drain, right? So you could you can calculate that, right? If I give you the numbers, you could you could tell me how quickly this the storage the storage in the bathtub is either increasing or decreasing. And if the pumping is greater than the storage, it's going to be what? Decreasing or increasing? Oh, sorry, if the pumping is greater than the recharge, is it increasing or decreasing? It's decreasing, right? And in the case of most aquifers in the Southwest, 
the pumping greatly exceeds the uh, the recharge. So um, to get so you can do those calculations, hopefully you can do the subtraction, but coming up with the numbers is really pretty painful. So because there's so little data available about uh, groundwater, but we did our best, and uh, we also try to estimate the volume of groundwater remaining. In this case, one of the groundwater aquifers were that uh, uh, in, in El Paso, the Waco Bolson. Uh, we also then try to, under, to, to calculate how much fresh water is left or how long do we have. And that's another fairly simple calculation. If you believe the numbers, we take the volume in the bathtub remaining and we look how quickly it's changing, right? So this would be uh, how quick, how long would it take if the, uh, for the bathtub to completely drain, right? You could do that. That, that calculation as long as you had the numbers. And so we model this over a 50 year period with some assumptions. And one of the big assumptions was the population increase. And we used population numbers from the two cities. And so um, El Paso is expected to increase by 35% over the next 50 years. Um, and, but Ciudad Juarez on the other hand by, by 66%. And so the water demand is going to go up with that, with those population um, increases. And so here's where we have to cooperate over borders, right? How are we going to manage these uh, these increases? And it's very tricky, right? Because El Paso used to be much bigger than water is, right? So the rate of the, the, the most of the depletion was driven by El Paso for many, many years. But as Ciudad Juarez is population increased. And when it started to really overtake that of El Paso's, now Ciudad Juarez actually pumps more water out of this particular aquifer than El Paso. And so solving that is, uh, again, a really good uh, built peace building sort of thing, right? Uh, how do you uh, figure out how to manage the groundwater between two countries, especially when, with our predictions, admittedly, a lot of uncertainty uh, but our future business as usual, meaning uh, population increases, uh, uh, the stagnant uh, efforts in water conservation that we come out with at the fresh water in the aquifer, not just the, salt, the salty water, will de be depleted in, in, a, in a matter of decades. So are we going to run out of water? Never, right? Uh, well, we hope never, right? That what I want to show you uh, next, hopefully very quickly, is what's going to happen is that water is going to get more expensive, right? So water utilities are very good at securing water, but and and they'll do it what they think is the best way, but it's going to it's going to cost more water, or cost more. Uh, so we looked at the El Paso water service area and then developed scenarios on on increases in water rates based on uh, climate change impacts on river water availability, uh, depletion of the Waco Bolson aquifer, and then with these decreases in water availability, how the city might make up the difference between uh, the demand and the, uh, the supply. So the, um, the black line here is the current supply, average supply available for El Paso. Um, and then the uh, the orange line is the expected increase in demand. And so where the orange line crosses the black line in a matter of a, of a uh, maybe less than a decade, the demand will exceed at least the current supply. And you can see that the orange line is in parallel to the blue line, which is the population uh, increase. So this is uh, this is expecting maybe just minor, uh, minor increases in water conservation efforts. So where is that, wh where is the water going to come from to meet that gap in demand? So this is, this is information from El Paso water. And this is the rough unit cost for treating each of these different uh, su supply, uh, potential sources of supply, current and potential future ones. So the numbers, absolute value of the numbers, I don't think matter that much. I don't think you always think about dollars per acre feet. I do. Uh, I don't expect you to, but it's really the relative amount. So 
This is the cost of pumping fresh water from either of the two aquifers uh, that uh, El Paso water draws from. And then this is the cost of the water from the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande water costs more because it's a bit dirtier to begin with. So it's more expensive to treat this than the fresh groundwater. And then you've probably heard that we also depend on desalinated groundwater, um, uh, desalinated brackish groundwater. And so the cost of that is more than three times the cost of treating the fresh water. So this is basically the cost of electricity and the upkeep of the, the uh, treatment system that's used to take the salt out. And then here's advanced wastewater purification and aquifer recharge. So this is taking wastewater, treating it very, very carefully, and then putting it back, uh, putting it into the groundwater aquifers. And so that's about uh, um, four times more expensive than the Rio Grande water. And then the last bar here is building a pipeline to uh, take water from a, a remote aquifer. And so the, this is based on a plan to build a pipeline from Dell City, more than 100 miles from here, pump the water out and, uh, uh, and then pump it through a pipeline to El Paso. So this is far by far the, the most expensive, but this is, the, this is where um, El Paso water has chosen to to be resilient is, is by going to another aquifer and using that uh, for imported uh, groundwater. And we can discuss that more um, with the in questions. So, um, all, so we have those costs. We have the current El Paso water plans to implement those different future projects. And that allows us to calculate the future changes in water supply costs. So this is showing from 2020 to 2070, how much we expect co the cost of water supply to increase. And we have a bunch of different scenarios because we don't know how severe climate change will affect us. We don't know exactly what options, what El Paso might, water might end up choosing to augment the water supply. But you can see in all of them, the, the costs are going to increase by a lot, right? More, no matter what scenario, uh, by two times, three times, and and perhaps even even uh, even more than that. So those where where are the uh, um, where's that money going to come from? Us, okay, ratepayers, right? To some extent, El Paso Water gets grants and so forth, and to uh, to supplement uh, the revenue that comes in. El Paso Water uh, again depends on the water rates. El Paso Water also owns a lot of land in El, in El Paso, which is a very good source of income. And so we don't know exactly how much the utility will want to offset these increased costs with increased water rates uh, versus selling, uh, selling the land. But now what we try to do is to predict how much water rates will increase and then look at uh, what fraction of people's income uh, or how the fraction of income that people use to pay for water might increase. So anybody want to guess about like in your households, what fraction of income in the household you're using to pay for water? And it's going to vary, right? Because our incomes vary, our water use varies, but is it, uh, let's see, is it more or less than the, uh, the streaming services bill? That's a personal question, right? Or the ones that you least know about. Is it more or less? Like, would you, just for a typical person, the water more? Uh, less, yeah. So if you look at your bill, if you ever have, there's a lot of different charges on there. If you separate just the water, um, I guess it depends on the household. But uh, typically, if you separate out the water, I'm guessing it's less than what pe most people spend on on, uh, on streaming services. But again, it, it varies. So you might be spending maybe a hundred, a hundred and twenty on average, a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars just for the water, right? There's a bunch of other charges on that bill that will increase it by a factor of two, uh, 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 of two or three. And everybody's different, right? Um, Okay, so 
if we look at the spatial uh, distribution of some 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 demographics in El Paso, um, the the um, so this is a map of 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 the, the El Paso Water Service Area, and then the divisions there are census tracts. They're pretty big divisions. They're very weirdly shaped, and nobody really understands how they got their shapes, but here they are. And so you can look up in the census. You guys could do this yourself, uh, very easy. Um, and you can look at average income, medium income, incomes of quintiles, and so forth by, uh, by census tract. And so the darker the color, the more red the color here, the lower the uh, the income. And this is annual income. So if you know something about the geography of El Paso, it's not too surprising to find very low income here below below I-10, and then in the uh, in the in the lower valley, and then also some of the higher income areas, for example, Country Club area and Coronado up up. Uh, up there. So th this is, if you look at the, the layout of El Paso, this is not too surprising. On average, though, 20% of our population is below the poverty line. And of course, you know that uh, more than 80% are, are Hispanic. And, and then many of us also um, were, were foreign born, typically from, uh, from Mexico. So what we did is we established a baseline of indoor water use to study how much people will be paying in the future for just indoor water, not, not outdoor water um, for now. And then we also added in water for evaporative cooling use. So probably many of you are familiar with how swamp coolers or evaporative coolers work. But they use water, right? They blow air over, dry air over the water. It picks up the water by evaporation. The evaporation process, does that heat up or cool things? Everybody knows from, from their thermodynamics class, right? The coolest things, right? Evaporation cools just like your sweat, sweating is supposed to cool you down. So this was supposed to be the absolute minimum water being used. Indoor water uses, which is primarily uh, toilets, a very small slice of it would be uh, drinking water, but also water use for hygiene, whether it's showers, ba ba baths, or washing dishes, plus the evaporative cooler use, and, uh, uh, use um, but not, not indoor water use, or so out, not outdoor water use. And then this is kind of the aggregated results here. So what this, sorry, com somewhat complicated plot here is showing over the next 50 years, how much, uh, how many households, the fra or the fraction of households in El Paso that will be spending a given fraction of income on indoor water? Okay, so let's take one of these lines here. So this line here uh, represents the greater than 5%. So right now, very few uh, uh, households are spending more than Sorry, that's, yeah, sorry, that's seven and a half. Yeah, five percent. So very few households right now are spending more than five percent of their income on that indoor water. But as water costs continue, that's going to go up and up and up and reach a maximum of about 30 percent. So 30 percent of households will be paying more than 5% of their income. And again, this is just for indoor water. Now, there are a lot of assumptions here, a lot, a lot, a lot of assumptions that you can throw darts at. Um, and one important one is that we're not uh, anticipating that people will reduce their water use, right? If, it's, if costs are going to go up like this, what's your reaction? You use less water. However, this is indoor water use, right? We might be willing to cut back on our outdoor water use if we see that as a luxury, but it's it's much more difficult to cut back on indoor water use because those are water uses associated with with hygiene and, and of course uh, drinking water and so forth. So when we talk about elasticity to price. Outdoor water use is very elastic, meaning that if you increase the price, will decrease the outdoor water use. But indoor water use is much less elastic because people tend to want to keep using that amount for for the indoor water use because they don't see that at, as, a, as a luxury at all. So just to uh, uh, then uh, summarize here, so um, 
we already know that climate change variability has affected water, uh, climate change variability has affected river water availability and the drought we experienced for the last 20 years or so could be the norm for the next 50 years. Um, and then uh, the climate change indirectly, uh, indirectly affects groundwater, right? Because the more variable the river water is, the more groundwater we use. And then increased population in our binational region could dri drive the depletion of, a, of a, the fresh water in, a, in one of our important groundwater aquifers in a matter of decades. And we also think that climate change and aquifer depletion uh, and, and the increased demand associated with population increase will result in steeply increasing prices for residential water. And in the worst case, 10% of households in El Paso will be paying at least 10% of their household income for just indoor water plus uh, the evaporative cooling. And so when we do these studies of vulnerability, the lesson at least like as a scientist is that we need to, um, uh, to look at a, a wide range of scales from the, uh, the regional scale, from the global scale, which is what drives climate change to the regional scale, to the city scale and all the way to the, the household and, and the individual. And part of that reason to have to consider these large distances is, again, if we look at, to make the point that the effects of climate change on river water are not because of climate change right here, it's because of climate change um, hundreds of, of miles away. So um, just a few uh, other publications um, that, that uh, have driven um, this work. Um, this is what you have to do at academic talks to impress people. Uh, and these could be comic books, right? Um, I'd be proud of that. Oops, uh, don't want to get into that. Okay, so thanks for your attention and I'd uh, be happy to hear any comments um, and also comments about solutions because um, uh, you, you guys are the, at least the young people here, you're the ones that are gonna, gonna drive this. So be happy to hear about potential solutions you think uh, can, can uh, get us out of this, but thank you. And I, when I hear you, you know, you can't fallow an orchard. It's a capital investment. But long-term, since you're talking long-term strategy, 30, 50 years, would you have a recommendation to agriculture here about how that, not just conservation, would it be possible to convert agriculture here to be more of a circular economy, you know, so raising, say, food crops that are produced locally as opposed to strictly export. Do you have any thoughts on that, sir? Um, please don't call me, sir. Thank you. Um, I, that, that, is, that, that is really a, a, a tough one. Um, this, you know, this place transition from cotton uh, to, uh, you know, to, to different crops and eventually to, to pecan. So it does show that farmers are willing to take a risk. And, and for me, at least when I think about um, I, you know, I don't think I'm, it's my place to prescribe what ag, uh, farmers and agriculture should do because it's a very risky proposition. Um, and so that, you know, where we see where people have been willing to make transitions, it's taken investments uh, from the taxpayers um, it, and it's taken a lot of long-term education. Um, the yeah, it's, it, I, I don't, I can't make any generalizations about pecan farmers. I, I think they, many of them really do feel like this is a family business they'd like to pass down. Um, my very little experience is that they find it hard to trust the climate models. And when you show those big bars there, right, separating, you know, showing how, how much uncertainty we have, which we have to be honest about, it's easy to point and say, ah, you know, it's just a bunch of stuff. So I, I haven't, yeah, I, I, I don't know the, uh, the answer to that. I think, you know, it might, it, the groundwater for the farmers is getting saltier and saltier, which they are noticing because there are losses associated with that. Uh, 
Um, they know that the river water isn't going to increase in, in any amount. Uh, they've even started to consider whether desalination for agriculture might work, uh, which shows you kind of the depths that they're willing to try to save the, the, the pecano trees. So um, I think also it would be good for us to get to know farmers, right, and not just use that word ambiguously and, and understand where they're, where they're coming from. So hopefully a, a dialogue would help. It's a long and probably not satisfying answer. Solutions? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you to repeat it in the mic, otherwise they can't hear on Zoom. <laughs> and then you can put the hand. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, ever since I drove to Dell City and somebody there told us that, you know, the water was gonna be sold to El Paso, like, mm. I don't know why that seems concerning to me, like mm -hmm. first thinking like, oh, why is El Paso looking out to buy water like from another city and like what means what that means for the people of Dell City? So I guess like is that something common that like cities do is like bring water from other places? It, it is. It's been in the West, the, the history, right? If you um, look at, for example, the California water system, that system moves water literally thousands of miles and why that happens politically culturally economically that's a very long interesting topic you could read the book cadillac desert if you're mm -hmm. interested um, um, to find out more about that we haven't shown much propensity to stop doing that i think you know that the major water projects probably are are over for a while because we're so uh, partisan. Because if you look at the major water projects in the 60s and, and 50s, and that was when uh, people could make deals across across the aisle. But um, you know, I think to make the transition in agriculture, it's got to happen from the federal level to to in, encourage people to do that. So I don't know if that was answering your your yeah. question and and. I did want to, yeah, I wanted to make one more comment. So there's some people are proponents of water markets. So in a water market, person that has water or water rights would show up, maybe not physically, but online and say, uh, let's say I'm a farmer and I don't really feel like growing my annual crop cotton this year. Um, and so you can have my allocation of water for irrigation for X dollars per acre foot or whatever volume you, you like. And then El Paso Water says, nah, that's too expensive. But then there's another farmer who hears that and says, oh, I'll sell it for less. And a market can develop, right? And you come to some sort of economic equilibrium where the uh, water goes to its highest value. But be careful, right? That sounds good, you know, that to create a market have markets ever bitten us on the butt in terms of equality in this world? No, okay, right? So um, you gotta be careful, right? Because if water goes to the highest bidder, that could leave people out in the cold. But theoretically, the farmer would be able to get enough for their water to uh, that would be similar or, or more than the profit they would have made on farming the cotton. Right, that's what's going through their mind. They said, if I can sell the water to El Paso for a little bit more than I would have made if I had grown the cotton, why wouldn't they do that? Uh, so water markets have been proposed for actually decades and decades. They haven't really taken off typically because of distrust that people say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. But um, there's often such conflict between especially urban and and agricultural water users that 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 doesn't happen and maybe that's for the best or the worst but sounds good in terms of like a neo neoliberal economic approach but um uh you have to be careful with that thank you yeah oh yeah oh, just kidding. <laughs> um I guess I just kind of wanted to ask, like, what do you say to people that don't believe in climate change and how does that impact, like, the spread of your word? Wow. Um, um, 
not to get political, but no, uh, well, I, I should be prepared to answer that question. Um, um, I guess I, I, I try to say, you know, I really think the risk is real, and the risk of not um, of not paying attention to it, at least in my mind, you know, what will happen to the next generations and the generations after that, that um, we just can't take that risk. Um, making them believe about the physics um, is, is a whole other um, issue. But I wish, uh, now I gotta think harder about that question. Thank you for that. <laughs> How about you, what would you say? I feel like at that point, it's all in the evidence. I feel like you just kind of have to look at statistics and just everything you presented to us and yeah. really take it into perspective of what our future could look like. And um, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I can tell you showing this plot is also is sometimes. I wonder if I should be doing that, right? Because this says, oh, just wait. Right. It'll happen again this will happen again. And, uh, you know, we know something about the climate then uh, and why there was so much snowfall and why the, uh, this, this, the snow melt generated was so high. We think those sorts of weather systems are just less likely to, you know, to occur. But, you know, sometimes I hesitate and I'm, I'm not gonna chop off data, right? We'd never do that, but, right, it's like, Right, this is due to, to occur again, right? And this last year, which really wasn't that great of a year, is is the start of that. How how would you go about explaining that? Right, I I struggle with it. Yes. So I know this. Hello, is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I know this is more focused on like the humanitarian part of it. Um, but do you know of any conservation that's going on to the natural springs that are up in the Franklins, not only for the people, but also for our wildlife and our uh, natural flora that's going on? Do you know of anything? Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just asking because I know a lot of the natural springs up there, they are depleting. I believe two of them have already dried up. And so I was just wondering if there's any conservation going towards them as well as us. I, I wish I knew. Do you do you know if that's related to like climate change or is um, I believe is it way up so. there, like where there's no development? Uh yeah. So it's higher up in the mountains where you go. Uh, one of my professors is uh, doing some work up there with the wildlife. Also, sad guys, but she has not found uh, evidence of mountain lions in a while. So we might be out of mountain lions here in the Franco Mountains, but. <laughs> um, she has been trying to get in contact with other people on that, mm. other people on that. But I just wanted to hear if you had known anything about any of the natural springs up there. I I don't know. Maybe there are others that do. Yeah. And, you know, did I did I mention and I'm glad you brought up that question. Did I mention water for the environment at all? No. OK. Um, uh, so what about that? Is it is it worth allocate? So when I say water for the environment, uh, what is that? What do you think that means? Right. So we use the river works very hard for us. Right. We use it to grow food. Um, and fiber, we use it to sustain our households. Um, is there is there anything left for the environment? So what it could we? So what do you think the? Um, so the we're used to seeing like the river water suddenly appear, right? Just suddenly appeared. Uh, we had about a week ago. And then it's going to stay on for a while. It might go up and down a bit if it rains some. And then it's going to shut down in August and become dry again. So we call that the hydrograph. So was that the hydrograph that we would would have seen 200 years ago? Okay. 
So for one thing, that we would see the peak at snowmelt time, and during most years, there would always be flow in the river. So can we restore that hydrograph? Should we? Could we? <laughs> I mean, most people would say it's probably impossible because we've changed the channel of the river so much. Okay, either by channelizing it or there's so much sediment built up. But there are efforts to establish wetlands kind of off the river. So, for example, the Rio Bosque wetlands, the Keystone wetlands, the wetlands in Las Cruces, the Mesilla wetlands, and so forth. So, and those wetlands require water. So, for example, the Rio Bosque, some of you may have gone to the talk on that, that requires water. So, uh, the Rio Bosque gets water from El Paso water and and uh, and ground and local uh, groundwater. Um, so there is water being dedicated to the environment. If you took that water and you divided it by the amount of water used, let's say by cities and um, irrigators, what percentage do you think that would be? You need a lot of decimal places, right? Point oh 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 one percent. So. Um, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked the question because it shouldn't completely ignore the fact that the Uruguay used to sustain a you know a thriving um, ecosystem. Yes. Thank you. Um, you mentioned agriculture and irrigation several times, and I'm curious how much of El Paso's water and Juarez, sort of the shared water supply, goes to industry. Pretty small amount. Um, so the the big industrial water users on the El Paso side would be the refinery. Um, there's a cheese processing plant. You don't want to hear the whole list, do you? Um, it's 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 fairly small. And then in in Juarez, most of the maquiladoras use very little water. And some of them have actually the newer ones have been built to be very water conserving because they don't. You know, they don't want disruptions, right? They they know that there's some potential of disruptions here and, and they, they, they want to uh they want to avoid that. Um so fair oh yeah, sorry. Um the, the electric power plant uh of course uses a substantial amount of water, right? If you go by El Paso Electric, you can see the cooling towers and you can see water vapor coming out of that. And so that is a Fairly substantial consumptive loss, but it's very small compared to the consumptive loss loss for for uh, irrigation. And they're tr also trying to be more water conserving uh, all the time because they are also concerned about the the future of water. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. the solutions. Meantime, while Alex speaks about Dr. Mayer speaks about the, the answer, uh, I want to invite you to join the next event at 3 p.m. right on the other side of the aisle. In the visualization lab, there's a presentation about three digital water-related projects and two of them involve uh, Dr. Mayer speaking. One is the bigger. Thank you. So thank you for the question, Yvonne. Did did we account for conservation measures? Of course, uh, as Yvonne is pointing out here, per capita water consumption is measured by the total amount of water used by both industry and residential water has decreased substantially. Some of that is due to conservation measures. It's also due to changes in industrial water use. Um, and also I pointed out that yes, people, as water becomes more expensive, people will use less. But our focus is on indoor water use, where it's been shown that the reaction to price increases for indoor water use 
is, uh, is substantially less than from outdoor water use. And then another comment, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, aquifer storage and recharge is becoming more cost effective by reducing the cost of pumping and allowing for natural recharge, natural implication for recharge. And there's a new project planned by El Paso Water. And those are very important uh, initiatives that El Paso Water is taking to increase aquifer recharge. It's still a pretty small amount compared to the, the difference between pumping and total recharge. And then um, Yvonne concurs that water costs are on the rise, but it's the low consumption users who will likely experience the least significant percentage increase in their expenses. Um, I think we'll have to see how El Paso water, you know, restructures its water rates as, uh, as water becomes more expensive. And hopefully it, there'll be less impact on low income users. However, water utilities, when they react to conservation, which we all want, uh, the reaction is typically to shift more of the rates to fixed costs rather than per gallon costs because, of course, as we conserve, which is a very good thing, we're reducing the revenue to the utility. And so the way they can recoup that is by having higher and higher fixed costs that, that don't depend on, um, on per gallon costs. 